How's everybody doing? Welcome to week 10, right? We almost made it. Last week of lectures. Here we go. Spinal anatomy. It's Tuesday, week 10, spring 2020. We left off on ligaments of the cervical spine, so let's see how far we can get through some of these. So ligaments of the cervical spine, we can divide those into the upper and lower ligaments. The upper cervical ligaments are associated with atlas, the occiput, and axis. The lower cervical ligaments are all the rest of them. Some of these you're familiar with, like the posterior longitudinal ligament, the anterior longitudinal ligament, the interspinous ligaments, supraspinous ligaments, intertransverse ligaments, ligamentum flavum. They're the same ligaments that we know for the thoracic and lumbar spine. But the upper cervical spine, we got a little weirdness up in that region. There's another one, too. The, uh, there's another weird ligament. Lig the nuchal ligament or ligamentum nuchae is weird throughout the cervical spine. But let's, t let's start with these upper, upper cervical ligaments. So let's talk about, we've talked about this a little, a posterior lanto-occipital membrane. Remember, a membrane is a ligament, but it's wide and it's thinner than a normal ligament, so it gets the name membrane. So it's thin, it's broad, that's why it's called a membrane. It runs from the posterior arch of atlas to the posterior rim of the foramen magnum. We've talked about the foramen magnum a little. In its most, uh, you could consider it, it's in the most superficial layer of these ligaments. Now there are more superficial ligamentum nuchae is more even more superficial, more posterior. But in these core ligaments, this one is kind of on the outside, and you'll see as we go in. All right. Um, so here it is, posterior lanto occipital membrane. So it's arising right here from the superior portion of posterior arch of atlas and it's inserting into the posterior part of the foramen magnum. Uh, and yeah, who does it kind of remind you of? Ligamentum flavum, right? And that's kind of a, it's a thinner, thinner ligamentum flavum is what it is. It's important because we have the V3 of the, the vertebral artery also penetrating through this as well. It pokes a hole right in this thing. We'll look at this here in a second. Okay, tightly bound to the dura. Now we can't see it on a picture of that, but the, remember the dura mater, if we cut this away, the dura mater is right there. In fact, it's stuck. Surgeons have to be really careful in this region because it is stuck to the dura mater, uh, tightly bound. In fact, some authors call the ligament the uh, plus the dura, they call it the posterior lanto occipital membrane spinal dura complex or the PAMSDC. It helps attach atlas to occiput, obviously, and you can think of it as an attachment of ligamentum flavum. Uh, remember the other ligamentum flavum. There's ligamentum flavum, right? It connects kind of the, po helps hold the posterior vertebral arches together. It's normally a thin ligament. It doesn't invade this space right here. Uh, right, this is the the epidural space or the the vertebral canal. So we can have trouble with this, though. Look at this cadaver section. Forty-two year old man with chronic pain who passed away, uh, and uh, the note said that they couldn't walk more than two blocks without having uh, leg discomfort and pain and heaviness. And on autopsy, there's a slice, of, not quite a mid-sagittal, it's parasagittal slice. This is the classic problem with people with lumbar stenosis. They have a bulging disc here, and then they have this huge ligamentum flavum. That should only be about this thick, right? That's how big it should be. And in humans, don't know why, but it can get incredibly big. I talk to clients all the time with this problem, and they can't. They have intermittent neural, they have NIC, uh, neurogenic intermittent claudication, uh, usually because of a combination of bulging ligamentum flavum and oftentimes a degenerative spondylolisthesis. 
All right, uh, what else do we need to know about the posterior lateral occipital membrane? Uh, what about its job? Its job is to limit flexion of occiput on atlas. Uh, laterally, it's pierced by part three of the vertebral artery. We saw that. Uh, also covers the groove for the vertebral arteries, which is on atlas. We've looked at that. We'll look at it again. And uh, this groove, by the way, allows for the passage of three things. Uh, the vertebral artery, vertebral veins, usually at least two, sometimes three, and the suboccipital nerve, which is nothing more than the dorsal ramus of C1. Right, remember, so here's a P to A. Is, well, you tell me. What are we looking at? What are we looking at? That's the atlas. That's a P to A view of atlas. There's the posterior tubercle. Posterior arch is here. And right underneath the superior articular process, we have a nice groove. Right? Vertebral artery will pop out of here and travel through that groove and then pierce the dura mater and become part four of the vertebral artery. All right? Everything we just said. And uh, there's a nice picture of it again. You can see how it's properly piercing the posterior lateral occipital membrane. Remember that's ligamentum flavum there? All right, now the posterior pontocle, an arcuate foramen or foramen arcuate, uh, is an important concept. Uh, so this is variable. Now Kramer says it's like 33%. I just went into a huge meta-analysis uh, study. I want to say 25,000 uh, CT scans and radiographs. And the, the prevalence was, across the world, the prevalence was about 9% in humans. And a partial, a partial posterior pontical was 13.6%. So it's definitely there. It's kind of like a transitional segment, even a little more common than that. Uh, and it occurs when the inferior lateral portion of the lateral occipital membrane ossifies. So in other words, this piece turns to bone, and it forms a tunnel over the vertebral artery. I think we've actually talked about this before, right? And that tunnel is called the arcuate foramen or foramen arcuate, uh, and the, the strut right here is called the posterior pontocle, right? Um, some nationalities, this is Kramer again, and it, this, he uses old research, so um, I haven't seen this with my own eyes. That seems pretty steep to me. Most of the new papers I see show the prevalence around between 5 and 10%. But supposedly this study where he got this from showed 57% in a Middle Eastern population, so I don't know. Uh, researchers are uncertain whether it's a congenital versus a, what does that mean, congenital versus acquired or degenerative. I should have, let me put a note there, 273. I can try to change that to acquired. What does that mean, though? Well, that means, are you born with this or are you not born with this? And unfortunately, nowadays, we can't take, we can't do x-rays on newborns. They did that back on sp spondylolisthesis, right? You can see that in my YouTube lecture on spondylolisthesis. X-rayed 500 newborns to see what the prevalence was. Crazy back in the day. Um, but yeah, so that covering of bones called the posterior pontical. The foramen that it creates is the arcuate foramen uh, or the foramen arcuate. If you go in and want to study this in PubMed, none of these terms pop up. The only term, and it's not mentioned in Kramer, but this is the only term if you want to study this, the foramen arcuate. Uh, that's the one. That, that's the key one for doing research. There's some other ones: uh, Freeman Arcuate Atlantis, Kimberly's anomaly. But yeah, there's the best match matches with that. Right. So here's a kind of an overhead view, and there is a ossification of just a piece of the posterior lateral occipital membrane, and it's formed a hole for the vertebral artery to pass through. 
uh, and that's the arcuate foramen that it passes through a foramen arcuole. Right? Here's one of our specimens that we actually have a copy of this thing uh, with one. There's not one on this side, but we have a complete posterior pontacle here with an arcuate foramen, a foramen arcuole. We can also see real nice the ADI space. I might like this picture for a lab, right? This would be good to be on your lab test. Right? Shows a lot of cool stuff. An older, nice and scalloped. Uh, this superior articular process, facet for superior articular process, TP, transverse foramen. Uh, there's the groove for the vertebral artery right there. There's the posterior arch. Posterior tubercle. Okay, you guys know that. Uh, foramen arcule versus headaches. There's some new research. Uh, Kramer had older research. Uh, Kramer, uh, but I did confirm it with newer research. So this, uh, I'm not sure how to say say his name. Pekala, Pekala, I would guess. 2018, nice paper. 2018 paper. It was a meta analysis study of all the studies. And there's no question that there is a statistically significant association between migraine headaches and run-of-the-mill headaches in people with these posterior ponticles, foramen arcules. Uh, so that's something you look for when you're treating your chronic headache patients. What to do about it, uh, no, they've tried to decompress them. I haven't found any research in that yet. But maybe causing some some insufficiency. Maybe it's kinking the pipes a little bit as the vertebral artery passes through here. And that's the next question. Forearm and arcule versus vertebral basilar insufficiency. Is the little hole crushing down on the on the vertebral artery? 2007, uh, Tubbs et al. investigated that. They did, It's a small study. 60 cadavers. I mean, that's more than our, what do we have, two cadavers left now? I think we have two cadavers. Um, but 60 cadavers down to, um, well, they, they dissected and studied 60 cadavers with regard to the prevalence uh, and whether or not that foramen was squishing the vertebral artery. And yeah, it was it was present, posterior pontical, foramen arcue was present in 5% of the specimens. And a significant part of the cadavers did, in fact, have compression of the vertebral artery. Unfortunately, there was no historical data. Those 60, it would be nice if we had the medical history from those 60 cadavers to see if they suffered headaches or not, but they didn't have that. Okay, tectoral membrane. So this is the superior extension of the posterior longitudinal leg ligament. Posterior lantal occipital membrane is an extension of ligamentum flavum. Uh, so now if you remove, if you go deeper, like past the spinal cord, then you have an extension of the PLL, and that's called the tectoral membrane. Uh, this one doesn't start, remember the posterior lantal occipital membrane starts at atlas and runs to occiput. This one starts further down at C2. So it starts in the, the vertebral body of C2, it's attached. Uh, and it kind of takes the hand off from the posterior longitudinal ligament. And, uh, yep, it goes up to the foramen magnum, anterior rim of the foramen magnum. And, yeah, it is deep to the posterior lantal occipital membrane. In fact, it's completely on the other side of the, uh, the spinal cord from it, so it's way deep. Uh, it's superficial to the cruciform ligament, as we'll see in a second. Uh, it inserts into the anterior rim of the foramen magnum. We said that. Uh, so here's the anterior up here. The posterior would be coming out of the plane of the page. Uh, and there's atlas. There's axis. So right about here, it just it just changes names. Here's the PLL right here. Uh, and yeah, there is the tectoral membrane running up and inserting into the anterior lip here, the foramen magnum. Interesting though, it does give off a little deep branch. See this little branch right here on each side? So accessory atlanto-occipital membrane. Some people think it's just a deep portion of this ligament, as we'll see in a second. All right, there's from what I'm 
lecturing in school and I don't have these nice drawing tools. Here's an over, uh, kind of an overhead view with the calvarium of the skull removed. So the top of the skull cap is removed. And we can see the three compartments, right? There's an anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. So this is more out of the plane of the page. This is deeper. This is deeper. So it's like three stairs right here. Sphenoid is in yellow. We have a little saddle right here. Uh, and that's where the pituitary gland, that's the cella tersica, hypophyseal fossa. And then there's a front edge uh, and a dorsum cella, tubercular cella in the front. Those are kind of the front and back of the saddle. But on the back behind the saddle, and even down in here, this is called the clivus. The clivus goes into the anterior portion of the foramen magnum. Right There's where we're talking about the tectoral membrane inserts right into that region. Really part of the, starting to be part of the clivus. Uh, you, can read, you can look at my videos on skull to see more. Just another view of the foramen magnum. Um, nothing more I need to say about that. So what is the job? What's the function of the tectoral membrane? It limits cervical flexion and extension, but that's that motion limiting is limited to just atlas and occiput, uh, i.e. anterior posterior sagittal rotation. Tomorrow we will talk about biomechanics. And I actually have a YouTube video on that because I did week 10 last quarter. So actually you probably have all these up. But make sure you watch these because they I'll test you. Every quarter is different. I always am switching things around. Yeah, we'll talk about that tomorrow. The accessory atlantoaxial ligament we've talked about just a second ago. It's got some AKA. Some just call it the lateral fibers of the tectoral membrane or the accessory atlantoaxial ligament or the deep part of the tectoral membrane. Yeah, many authors think it's just deep fibers of the tectoral membrane, as I just showed you. It courses from the base of the posterior part of the odontoid process to the inferior medial surface of the lateral masses of atlas. And it kind of blends in a little bit with the posterior medial capsule of the lantoaxial joint. Right, there's the lantoaxial joint right here. Oops. Lantoaxial joint. And then here's the fibers. What happens if I do do that? Got to zoom in. Oh, pointer options are here as well. But color options. Oh, yeah. So can I change color? Yeah, cool. I learned something. So here's the uh, accessory atlantoaxial ligament right there. Right, tectoral membrane starts right there. Got it? There's the other one. There's a nice drawing of it. Without the tectoral membrane, it's been removed. In fact, in this author called it the deep part of the tectoral membrane, but we're calling it the accessory. Kramer calls it the accessory atlantoaxial ligament. But there it is. All right. Nice view of the cruciform, the cross, right? I think we've talked about that a little bit. But let's hit it again. Cruciform ligament. Uh, it's cross-shaped. That's how it gets its name. Uh, it's divided into three parts. Probably the most important one is this transverse ligament of atlas. Ligamentum transversarium. Another AK for that. You can always reverse these to kind of get a word. If you ever see that on boards, remember that you can reverse these and kind of make them Latinish, kind of Latin sounding. Uh, superior longitudinal fibers or a band. Uh, there's an inferior longitudinal band or fibers or any other word you can think of there. Um, so here it is again. We just looked at it. The inferior fibers are here. Superior fibers are here. Now they're behind this guy. Let's see how easy it is to change colors. I have to go. It's like three deep to change colors. Um, but behind here, let's see, the dens would be right here. There's an apical ligament that is hiding behind this. It's the superior fibers. We'll look at that, that one in a second. I wonder if there's an eraser here too. 
Partner option. Racer. Huh. Yeah. All right. There's the transverse ligament, which we did look at. And just to make case, transverse portion of the cruciform ligament, the TLA, uh, the transverse atlanto ligaments, the horizontal portion of the cruciform ligament is the transverse ligament of Atlas, super important for stability of C1, C2. It's responsible for this ADI space, holds the odontoid process to the anterior tubercle, prevents spinal cord injury and compression during flexion. It uh, prevents, yeah, it, it helps maintain the neural foramen and neural canal at that level. Uh, also allows for the atlas to pivot around the axis. So yeah, there it is again, super important ligament. Has been called the most important ligament of the occiput C1, C2 joint complex. We already know it connects to the lateral mass of atlas via two little tubercles called the colliculus atlanti. I do like that word for some reason, colliculus atlanti. That would be both colliculus atlantis is one. It sits in a horizontal plane. There's the colliculus atlantis. There's one, there's the other one. Right? And then that ligament would run right between them. The dens would go right in there, right? Okay. Spinal cord would be right in here. Rule of thirds, we won't get into the rule of thirds. There's a posterior pontical, look at that. And there's, what's that hole called? Arcuate foramen, foramen arcuate. Great. Oh, I did it already. Anterior, the ligament connects. Remember, it has a little facet on it, doesn't it? It has a fibrous cartilage little pad uh, for it to connect with the facet of the posterior inferior portion of the dentoid process. Remember that was a region called the groove for the transverse ligament of atlas. And strangely, one of the rare times that you ever form a true diarthroidal joint between not two bones, but a bone and a ligament. Uh, so that's high yield board stuff. And there's a little picture of it there. It's got a joint capsule. It's got a synovial membrane in there just like the one in front does between the facet of the dens and facet of the anterior arch. Uh, so that's definitely strange, right? Uh, and again, the ADI space we've talked about, it never allows more than three millimeters of slip unless you have rheumatoid arthritis or unless you've been in a serious car accident, it's been torn, but never allows more than three millimeters of slip along the z-axis, not along the z-axis, it never allows more than three millimeters of slip or anterior translation. That's not right, because the z-axis is coming up. That would be, a, that's wrong, not along the z. Oh yeah, it actually would be the z-axis, yeah, yeah. I guess I better review my biomechanics, which I'm doing tomorrow. Yeah, that's correct, the z-axis. Uh, why is the ADI space, the lantodens interval, uh, or this is why it should never be more. If you cut that ligament in cadavers, then you have eight millimeters of translation uh, between atlas and axis, and it smashes right into the spinal cord. So you have to have that ligament intact. Here's a CT through the dens, and that's a normal looking ADI space. Superior longitudinal band, okay, those are just the fibers that rise from above. They run from the center of the transverse ligament superiorly uh, to the superior anterior portion of the foramen magnum. Uh, the posterior portion of the basilar portion of the clivus, example, uh, is in between the tectoral membrane and the apical ligament. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it is sandwiched in between. The tectoral membrane is behind it. Uh, then you have the superior longitudinal fibers, and then you have the apical ligament, which we'll look at here in a second. So there they are again. Right, superior fibers. They do connect into the anterior part of the clivus. 
right? It's, they'll probably attach in the foramen magnum, but they definitely extend further into the clivus. Primary job is to hold the transverse ligament in its proper position. Therefore, you could say it aids in holding the odontoid process uh, in position, They're holding the atlas, and that should be and 300 and a Dante process together. It may help limit flexion extension a little bit too. The inferior band is attaches the cent to the center of the transverse ligament and runs to the posterior body of C2, prevents the transverse ligament from migrating too far superiorly, kind of holds that transverse ligament in place, helps limit flexion of occiput and atlas on axis, superior band and transverse ligament help in this function. Not terribly exciting. There it is. Kind of getting into the body of C2. And there's the transverse ligament. Just kind of helps stabilize it. Just like the anterior helps stabilize it. Helps hold that band in position. Aller ligaments. Where's the aller ligaments? There they are. Can't They run from the dens to the foramen magnum. Lateral part of the foramen magnum. But we got to do better than that because I can't. You can see they're hidden by the dens, right? We talked about the facets for those things. They arise from the facets of the posterior lateral tip of the odontoid process. Some fibers may cover the entire posterior lateral dens. Uh, they pass laterally uh, to a roughened region on the medial surface of the condyle. All right. So remember the Mr. Bill? Was it Mr. Bill? There's a facet, that's where they arise from right there. There's Those are the facets for the aller ligaments. And they would run up here. The occiput's not in here, but they would run up to the occiput. Just like that. Oh no, it's Mr. Bill. What's that thing? That's the groove for the transverse ligament of atlas. Okay. What do they do? Uh, it's very complex and not biomechanists are having kind of a hard time figuring out what they do. Uh, but we do know one thing. They limit the opposite side rotation. Uh, so this is a PA view of the head, right? But it's a coronal cut, so we've cut the back of your head out. Your nose and eyes, your eyes would be up here, but they would be into the plane of the page. So if you rotate your head this way, if you rotate to the left, uh, this one stabilizes and becomes taut, uh, so it's affected, it tenses, it prevents excessive rotation to the contralateral side. So it limits contralateral axial rotation. See how that works? Uh, together they help limit a little bit of flexion as well. should really put together there. Together, I'll just go change it in your slides. That's terrible. Together. Oh my goodness. 307. Together. Beautiful coronal cut through the dens. There's the odontoid process. What are these joints called? Atlantoaxial joints. What are these joints called? Atlanto-occipital joints. And you can see ligamentum flavum. See the fibers of it? I don't even want to draw it. It's so beautiful. And they're attaching right into the occipital condyle. And here's the other one, a little bit shorter. Cool. Here's this little skinny apical ligament. Uh, so this runs from the posterior superior and right off the top of the dens, but it runs from the posterior superior aspect of the dens to the anterior wall of the foramen magnum. It's about 2.5 centimeters, right, about an inch. It's covered posteriorly by the superior band of the cruciform ligament. Okay. Superior fibers blend in with the superior longitudinal band. Cruciform ligament as they attach up into the occiput probably functions to prevent vertical translation. 
uh, like distracting the head. All right, or trying to grab the head and pull it straight up. Really nice picture of this. Here's the apical ligament right there. See how that goes? So who's behind it? Who's post here? Immediately post here behind it. Immediately post here would be this guy. So those are the superior fibers of the cr the cru uh, cruciate uh, the cruciate ligament, and then behind that we have the tectoral membrane. Right, so it's like a sandwich. I think I said the tectoral membrane is on the other side. There's a the spinal cord does not go in between there. Spinal cord would be back here. Okay, so that I misspoke. These three are boom boom boom. They're like a sandwich. Got it? And now we're going to meet this one now, the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. Um, now this one is on the other side. So let's talk about that one. It's located in front of the apical ligament. Yeah, because there's the apical ligament. This is a mid-sagittal view. Here it is right here. Uh, located in front of the apical ligament. Uh, it, it's considered to be actually in front of the foramen magnum because the foramen magnum, there's the anterior lip. Posterior lip would be back here somewhere. Right, so it's in front of it. Uh, it connects to the superior part of the anterior arch of atlas. Well, there's the anterior arch of atlas. So yeah, it sure does. Connects to that. Uh, it is quite broad. It's kind of a, almost has two fibers, as we'll see here from the back side. Uh, so it has these fibers in the middle, and it's a continuation of the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament. And just like the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, it starts right here. But right below it is the anterior longitudinal ligament. Right above it is the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. But it has another nest of fibers here as well. And those connect to the atlanto-occipital capsule right here. See how these fibers are blending in with that capsule? So that's a little strange. So it blends laterally with the capsule ligaments or capsular ligaments of the atlantoaxial articulation, the atlantoaxial joint. Is that true? Uh, the atlantoaxial joint. Yeah, so it must be down here as well. So this picture is wrong. So these fibers, these are... This is all part of the anterior atlanto. No, that's wrong because it's atlanto-occipital. It doesn't go down to the axis, so this drawing is right. This is not, uh, that was not correct. Right, uh, it's continuous with the anterior longitudinal ligament. That's true. Uh, we said that happens right here. That was true. Can see I just put these slides in like an hour ago. Uh, limits extension of occiput and C1, yep. Blends laterally with the capsular ligaments of this is where it's wrong. This should be atlanto occipital articulation. So that is flat out wrong. Atlanto occipital. I'll write that down occipital articulation then that makes sense right because that's that's it let's get rid of this stuff uh, where's the erase pointer options there's the erase all yeah that makes sense because that's the atlantoaxial joint here and yeah okay all right hey we're done and, yep, we'll see you tomorrow for our last Spinal Anatomy lecture.